Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Great. So thank you all for being here and thank you, um, Jen and uh, the rest of um, SML for having me. It's uh, great to see um, UNH Marine Field Science um, in action. And I'm excited to tell you a bit about my research trajectory and my interests in um, microalgal symbioses and um, environmental aspects or the environmental modulators of uh, those successes and particularly um, trace metal um, biogeochemistry and its influence on the um, success of these symbioses and interactions. And uh, before I get into my spiel, just a little bit about me, as Jen mentioned, and, um, I went to Clark for my undergrad and master's, then Penn State, then some time at URI, and now um, I'm at University of New Hampshire. And initially at Clark, I was drawn to freshwater, um, but in the forms of being a um, swimmer on Clark's team, and then also starting out in a freshwater stream ecology lab. But the interest in um, coral reefs and coral algal, algal symbiosis was um, spurred on by a semester abroad in the Turks and Caicos, and then um, more um, field courses in the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences. And so for my master's, I wound up um, obtaining some small grants and returning back to Bermuda to study the reproductive ecology and symbiosis ecology of mustard hill coral. And then that's where I also started to get into more um, lab, molecular lab work. And the trace metal obsession started when I was at Penn State. And I quickly identified this knowledge gap in the field where um, there wasn't too much on the trace metal biogeochemistry and tropical marine ecosystems and particularly of coral reefs and how it impacts the success of that um, symbiosis, which is really critical to that ecosystem. And that interest led me to do some field work in, to, in Palau and Taiwan. And um, while I was there, these um, field um, excursions included on um, scuba diving, or so field coral research, um, a lot of algal culturing, and some photophysiology, and um, also some bioinformatics. And I also began to um, embrace my um, or I guess passion for public speaking, and then also, um, you know, doodling and science illustration. Um, I spent the early part of the pandemic as a postdoc at URI, where I worked on some coral on a chip culturing. Um, and now I'm at the University of New Hampshire, and um, I've expanded from being a coral symbiosis biologist, so really studying the friends aspect of microalgal symbioses and interactions to also incorporating um, the food and foes aspect. And I'll explain what I mean by that um, shortly. So I like to call my research or I nickname it friends, food and foes, um, but there are many different um, talents and um, widespread functional diversity of marine microalgae, or you might know them as phytoplankton, and that includes um, predatorial species, prey species, some produce toxins and call, cause harmful algal blooms, some are bioluminescent, and then also um, many microalgae are also symbiotic, and I'm going to focus on that for um, a big chunk of my talk. And I call um, algae and symbiotic uh, relationships as phycosymbiosis. Um, and this can refer to several different interactions, including mutualisms, where the um, both species benefit from um, the symbiosis with one another, and coral dinoflagellate symbiosis is um, a classic example of that. And then this also includes commensalism, where one species benefits and one is unaffected, such as um, manatees and the algae that actually live on their skin. And this can also include parasitism. So one species benefits and one is harmed. And for the purpose of this example, um, sometimes coccolithophore bacterial symbiosis falls into this category. And the ecological and evolutionary success of symbiosis um, can be attributed to numerous biotic and abiotic factors. 
Um, these biotic factors include interspecies interactions such as predator prey interactions, um, predation, um, the availability of food, and also marine invasions. Whereas abiotic factors include um, temperature, like and um, sea surface temperature warming, uh, light profiles, and light availability. Also, nutrient biogeochemistry, and I'm particularly interested in trace metal biogeochemistry um, because trace metals are rare essential elements where the addition of just um, really minuscule amounts will have really large ramifications, um, both uh, at the organismal scale and its um, physio physiology and fitness, and then also at the ecosystem scale. And so um, the driving question of my research program is how do trace metals mediate microalgal symbioses and trophic interactions? What are the consequences to algal physiology and what are the cascading ecological impacts and implications? And I look at this through a lens of thinking of microalgae um, and their interactions with other taxa, such as mutualisms and, and symbioses, so friends, um, food, as in um, thinking about microalgae that consume, that are capable of um, consuming prey, and then also foes when um, microalgal symbiosis um, turns sour. And I use a combination of lab culturing and field studies to get at these um, aspects of research. So today I'll be talking about, um, I'll spend a lot of time talking about the friends portion and um, using coral dinoflagellate symbiosis as, and um, the metal exchanges within this relationship as an example of um, mutualisms and um, talking about some of my work in dinoflagellate iron limitation, and then thinking about how metal profiles or metal ohms, um, how they can be indicators of symbiosis ecology and heat resistance. And then we'll, then my talk will shift to talk um, up to um, talking about work that I've um, just begun at UNH and um, my foray into dinoflagellate feeding ecology and uh, mixotrophy, so algae that can acquire energy from both photosynthesis and prey consumption, and um, what research we hope to um, do in the Great Bay of New Hampshire. And then ending on um, microalgal symbioses um, turning into foes and talking about algal bacterial communication and when coccolithophore bacteria symbiosis turns into a murder mystery, um, where this uh, cosmopolitan bacteria can produce a chemical which will which can cause cell lysis and cell death and then also thinking about who else is on this bacteria's hit list and the implications for the ecology and evolution of those victims so all of that to say um, we'll start a bit with dinoflagellate iron limitation um, and this kind of goes back to the core of my dissertation and I'm interested in iron limitation in particular, and iron is my favorite element on the periodic table. Um, it's limiting, it, it limits primary productivity or photosynthesis in many ocean regions. Um, however, there are many flavors of oceanic nutrient limitation uh, that are colored as dots in this map. And where the red dots um, represent areas where iron limitation has been observed, and then other colors represent other forms of micronutrient, major nutrient, and vitamin limitation. And something I'd like to point out is that a lot of these red dots are in fact in tropical marine ecosystems, which frequently get written off as, um, you know, not metal deficient or not iron deficient. Um, whereas that's not entirely true. So iron limitation um, and iron deficiency can play out in coastal and coral reef ecosystems. Um, and this can be observed at both the organismal level um, where iron input can elicit a strong organismal response and by uh, increasing growth in the density of algal symbionts. Whereas at an ecosystem level, there have been um, instances of metal shipwrecks um, causing ecosystem stable state transitions where the coral reef um, slowly turns into a, a fleshy algae dominated reef with um, a new assortment of bacteria. And within the coral symbiosis, there are many routes of iron exchange, where I'll primarily be talking about the coral in the dinoflagellate up here. 
no, my pointer's not um, hitting the TV screen. So I'll primarily be talking about the coral and the dinoflagellate, but there are other um, microorganisms living within the uh, coral holobiont tissue. So coral and um, community of microorganisms and iron can be exchanged in a number of different ways. However, I'm going to focus on our iron exchange and the implications or of iron exchange or lack thereof between the coral and the dinoflagellate because the breakup of these mutualism, mutualisms can cause um, ecosystem-wide consequences of dysbiosis or the breakup of a symbiosis where under temperature stress, um, the algae are expelled from the host coral because they're not providing enough sugars from photosynthesis. And so um, my hype, or I'm interested in what is the role of iron in this um, dysbiosis or in the events leading to the expulsion of the symbiodinase. How does this play a role? And one of the reasons why I'm particularly fond of the algal side of coral algal symbiosis is because even though um, you know corals are known to associate with microscopic algae, um, you might know them as those anthelae. It's actually a really diverse family of um, algae called the Symbiodinaceae. There are currently 11 described genera and four of them can form symbioses with stony corals. Stoning corals are distinguished by the ability to deposit limestone skeletons or reefs. And then another nine um, form symbi can form symbioses with other invertebrates, including some jellyfish, anemones, foraminifera, sponges, and so on. There are two that are solely free living, um, up to like currently six observed genera that in culture with bacteria um, will actually like form skeletons or symbiolites. So there will be that um, calcification in culture. And eight are culturable. And what culturable means is that these microalgae can be reared in the absence of a cnidarian host. So just imagine your Nalgene bottle with seawater and a nutrient, a little supplement of um, liquid nutrients and essential elements in the water bottle. And you put in some symbiodinase, give it um, room temperature and enough light. And then soon, like hopefully if it grows, it'll be as dense and the color will be like emergency or not quite orange juice, but on the way. So. Many of these are culturable, which makes them a fantastic resource for um, lab work, and especially because um, the cultures within this family span um, lineages from different ecological guilds. And also, there's a lot of documented variation of heat tolerance, both within and between genera, which creates a great experimental setup. So then, with all of this, um, preface of why uh, symbiodinase cultures are great for, you know, experimental research. Um, the a part of my graduate work was working with symbiodinase cultures and asking the question, how does iron availability affect the symbiodinase? And to address that question, I worked with cultures representing um, many different ecological lifestyles. On the top is one species that um, is necrotrophic, so it only is found in um, diseased or bleached coral tissue. It's, it's a really peculiar species, um, and but in the same genus, there's also a cosmopolitan species found in a jellyfish. And then the other two that I'll be talking a lot about, Breviolum sigmophilum and Breviolum minutum, this one is temperate and associates with the Rhode Island state coral. Um, this is a tropical species that's found in an, in an anemone worldwide. And this is a free living species. So we can look at um, their responses to iron limitation of free living, symbiotic, temperate, tropical, and so on. So I expose these cultures from, to conditions um, ranging from iron starvation to replete conditions, tracked cell density, and looked at their metal contents and gene expression profiles. Um, I won't talk about the gene expression profiles uh, today, but 
happy to talk about it at another time. What I'd like to emphasize is that symbiodinase cannot grow without iron. So this blue vial right here is literally what um, alkyl culturing looks like. It's a, sometimes a glass vial, sometimes a sterile plastic flask um, with seawater and essential vitamins and nutrients. And when those are added, you'll see proliferation um, and that uh, brownish color. And as iron concentrations approach starvation, um, the cells are not able to grow. And this is true for species of um, you know, all different um, ecological guilds and including the free living and the symbiotic and the temperate and tropical, everybody really needs their iron. And um, the iron, as iron is added back into the media, iron contents increase with iron concentration. And on this figure on the x-axis is iron concentration. Um, and each species is in a different color and it goes from um, high to middle to high, middle and low from the left to right, yes. Um, and on the y-axis is iron content. And for each species as iron, con as iron concentration in the media increases, so does um, iron content and uptake. And that's true for everybody from all of the different um, ecological guilds. And this relates back to the basal importance of iron in um, bio geo or biochemistry and that um, many of the enzymes important for photosynthesis and respiration and cell cycle maintenance um, rely on iron cofactors to function. So as um, iron concentrations increase in the media, it was expected that um, the iron content would increase as well as growth to um, fulfill those functions. And a lot of this led me to thinking, you know, why aren't they bleaching? So why do some corals bleach and some don't? Why will some corals bleach um, or corals like next to one another? Why will one bleach and one not? Why are some host symbiont pairings more resistant to heat stress than others? Um, and so I, given this question, I uh, ran a follow-up experiment um, looking at how iron availability influenced the thermal endurance of two cultures, one being the um, tropical species in the anemone, Breviolum minutum, and then the other being the temperate species, Breviolum sigmophilum. They're exposed to a range of iron concentrations and temperatures. And the punchline of the story was that iron limited um, the breviolum survival to heat stress. This figure is organized by iron concentration with the tropical species on the top and the temperate species on the bottom. Um, it is color coded by temperature with blue being the lower temperature, gray in the middle and orange in the high temperature. On the y-axis is specific growth. And what I'd like to point out is that at high temperatures, only the higher iron treatments grew, whereas their counterparts at high temperature and low iron concentrations um, were not able to grow. And throughout the experiment, um, this temperate species, Breviolum sigmophilum, maintained faster growth rates at high temperature, but also in all treatments. And overall, it was less sensitive to heat stress. And so from the last figure, um, in response to heat stress, uh, both species decreased their growth, which was to be expected. Um, breviolum sigmophilum a little less so. And the photophysiology of breviolum sigmophilum was also uh, a little less impaired relative to um, the heat sensitive species, breviolum minutum. Uh, the lipid contents of breviolum minutum increased and those of breviolum sigmophilum were unchanged, which was surprising. And where things got interesting was breviolum sigmophilum and a much lower phosphorus uptake rate. Um, and the opposite was found in Breviolum minutum, whereas both increased um, their iron uptake, which um, leads me to think that the iron phosphorus ratio is a really important um, indicator of, um, you know, coral or coral symbiont ability to endure heat stress. And so broadly, I think these have, um, important implications for um, susceptibility to coral bleaching. And so in the field of coral biology, we're constantly in search 
of these um, like or evaluating heat sensitive and heat tolerant um, host symbiont pairings um, and comparing and contrast and looking at the strategies of how the heat tolerant or what the heat tolerant uh, species does to beat the heat. And I call this the noodle arms dichotomy because it seems as though the heat tolerance symbionts um, are pumping more iron and um, this is an important strategy for them to beat the heat, whereas the heat sensitive um, counterparts ha don't, don't have that same um, ability to alter their iron uptake. And in a scenario where warming should increase and iron concentrations could decrease, this doesn't bode well for noodle arms and could exacerbate a coral bleaching event. So up until now, I've talked um, primarily, primarily about coral algal symbiosis and iron exchange. However, um, in this symbiosis, like there are several other trace metals that are important for the function and upkeep of the system, including metals like zinc and copper. And the uh, origin story of these importances is the biological demand and the um, biochemical requirements. And those demands lead to different partner exchanges and both are modulated by um, differences in environmental supplies. So I'm going to switch gears of talking about metal ohms or all of the metal contents or metal profiles of the coral and the symbiont as indicators of their ecology and resistance to heat stress. And this um, refers to this part is based in on the elementome in the biogeochemical niche, where an elementome is the quantity and proportion of elements. And so um, similarly, a metal ohm is the quantity and proportion of metals. And this varies by species, uh, species traits, the environment and also environmental stress. And each of these um, factors will have unique influences on the elementome and the metalomes of the corals and their symbionts. And this um, theory or line of thinking is um, an extension of the ecological niche. And there are three major drivers of the species specific differences that are commonly occur found in the elementomes. Um, and that is due to um, evolutionary history and relatedness, um, coexistence pressures, and also homeostasis and plasticity. And the coral algal system is great for looking at um, different niches or different ecological specialties because of the diversity among um, both partners. And so um, on the Nidarian side, there's um, stony corals or reef building corals, soft corals or sea fans, um, anemones, and also jellyfish. And on the symbiont side, which is my favorite side, um, the family Symbiodinaceae has 11 described genera um, with free living and symbiotic and opportunistic lifestyles. Their diversity mostly follows patterns of um, global symbiogenase or global coral diversity. And over 300 of these strains are culturable. So we've been able to ground truth some of the metal loam related hypotheses using algal cultures. And this figure is um, demonstrates how the species specific differences um, of the metal loams of two symbionts. So the orange uh, dots are the tropical species from earlier, Breviola minutum. And whereas the black diamonds are uh, the temperate species, Breviolum sigma phyllum, it's Halloween colors because it was made on Halloween um, a little while back. And what I'd like to point out from this figure is that in multivariate space, when all of the metal contents are considered, so not just iron, the whole suite of them, um, the metal ohm of the species um, are significantly different from one another. So their niche space does not overlap. And this doesn't, this is true of um, metal contents, whether it's normalized to phosphorus or carbon or the cell. Um, metal ohms as a whole are great indicators of species specific differences in the symbiodinaceae. And this is less so for um, looking at their photophysiology and their pigment profiles.
And this is part of a larger um, collaborative effort of looking at the metalomes of Symbiodenaceae and um, looking at the free living species, um, opportunistic species, symbiotic species, and then cultures representative of two genera that are the dominant symbiont genera in the Indo-Pacific. So where coral biodiversity is the highest in the world. And that's the genus Durastinium and Cladocopium. And that will take us to the marine ecosystems of Palau. And so uh, some of my PhD field work was in Palau and I'm biased, but it's a great place to do research because there's a lot of habitat differentiation um, across a small spatial scale. And one of the extreme environments are the lagoonal reefs in Nico Bay or the Rock Islands. And there are also um, fringing reefs, which are pretty mild environments. And within this um, diversity of habitats, there is a lot of variation in the, his in the sea surface temperature history. So in this map, all of the orange and red pixels represent um, habitats with warmer water temperatures. And in these habitats, um, corals are, or corals experience bleaching events less frequently. So they're primed in that warmer water. So in this map, and then also the um, bar graph, um, or the bar graph is the results of the map just in bar graph form. Um, bleaching prevalence is much lower in these warmer water environments, whereas in the cool water environments, so a lot of the green and blue dots, um, more mild temperatures experience um, much higher um, coral bleaching rates than their warm water counterparts. And the, my favorite part of this system is that there is symbiont zonation. And what I mean by that is that the corals that live in the harsh lagoonal environment um, associate with um, a certain genus of symbiont, whereas the, rel or the corals or the same set of corals live living in the cooler environment have a different symbiont. So, in, so there's a symbiont type for each environment, which um, allowed me to ask the question, do warm water corals have distinct metal ohms or metal profiles? And this uh, project involved um, sampling um, six different coral species from Nico Bay, which is a really harsh environment with um, futuristic temperature and carbon chemistry profiles. Um, even though it's a harsh environment, there's a high diversity of coral species in this environment, many of which are dominated or are uh, form associations with a genus um, known for heat tolerance called Durastinium. Durastinium means tough and whirling. Um, however, some corals also um, form associations with a heat uh, tolerant uh, lineage of Cladocopium. And then on the more mild offshore reefs, um, these are the temperature profiles are more reflective of current day conditions. However, the same set of corals lives in both environments, but they associate with different symbiont species. And so this is what one of our boat days looks like. This is what it's like going through the rock islands of Palau and then out through the reef flat. And once you get underwater, um, again, there's a really um, incredible amount of coral cover and diversity. And it was a fantastic place to um, do some of my dissertation research. And when we processed all of the tissue samples of both of the corals from both of these different sites, and then also the symbiont fraction of that um, holobiont, we found unsurprisingly that the same metals were found in both the coral and the symbiont and the tissues of both sites. So everybody has the same elements, but there are um, drastically different proportions of elements um, by site. Um, and this was highlighted by the really high amounts of zinc and cobalt in the corals from the warm water site. Um, what I like to say is heat tolerant corals are zinc sinks. 
even though I had hypothesis that they pumped more iron, um, zinc and cobalt seem to be the more important players um, right now. So this was observed across all of my species comparisons and both the host and the symbiont tissue, everyone in this warm water reef seemed to need a lot of zinc and cobalt. And look, when looking at their um, metal profile or metalome differences in multivariate space, um, they occupy different niches. Um, so the orange triangles being the warm water site and the blue circles being the cool water site, there's little overlap. So they have um, different nutritional requirements. And this is the coral symbiosis biology um, edition of you are what you eat um, and that this can be reflected by um, metalome differences. So we have our warm and our cool water site. And another neat part of the system is that the corals from the warmer water site um, are more heterotrophic, meaning that they acquire more energy from consuming planktonic prey and um, particular matter in the water column. Whereas the um, conspecifics from the offshore site, um, the cooler water site, um, rely more on photosynthesis. And so that means that part of the environmental signal of this warm water site is a lot of um, planktonic um, food. And that's not to say that those on the offshore environment aren't feeding. They're just feeding likely less and on different things. And so the metalone differences um, represent these um, two starkly different environments and also are confounded by their symbiont pairings and also are um, a product of um, the prey consumption. And so it results in the um, really different metal profiles. And this is part of a bigger collaborative effort, looking at the functional ecology of these um, elusive heat tolerant symbionts from the genus Durastinium. Um, the trace metal research um, is a part of the trophic ecology research. So thinking about, um, you know, how does feeding on prey influence the functional ecology and heat resistant of these host symbiont pairings? What happens when you outplant them to environments where there are, there's, they're less likely to free on prey and for, um, in, for the intent and like in some ways starved. Um, and then also thinking about their physiology and fitness and um, how um, uh, photosynthesis is impacted by heat stress. And then um, our undergraduate uh, Shane Tripp also did some work with the metalloenzymes and um, how they varied by the different um, reef habitats. And so with all of this, we're hoping to um, learn more about how trace metals contribute to dictating the distribution of durastinium. And so this um, question is also on like a small scale and micro environment scale. So um, for coral habitats, why is it found in some corals, but not in others? Um, and from a community ecology perspective, why is this um, elusive species only found in the rock islands, but not offshore? And then also the global diversity patterns of this genus. And um, some pressing questions are, you know, why can't all corals form um, some mutualisms with durastinium? Why hasn't this um, co-evolved across um, many different genera? And also what are the, how do trace metals um, and trigger symbiont shuffling and how does um, metal exchange impact um, heat resistance. And from a um, local dominance standpoint, I'm interested in um, what trace elements um, dictate the community ecology of Durastinium and where it's found and where it's not and how the metal seascapes or trace metal biogeochemistry varies by reef, um, reef type and how this influences their trophic and feeding ecology. And I think um, a lot of these questions will get back to this um, initial pressing question I had in graduate school. Why aren't they bleaching? Why are some coral symbiont pairings um, more resistant to heat stress, whereas others are more susceptible? What does iron have to do with it? And so here is where my talk transitions into the work that I've um, been starting at UNH. 
and um, my expansion into not just studying the symbiosis, um, biology and ecology of coral dinoflagellate mutualisms, but also um, branching out into studying the symbiosis of, of other algae and other um, taxa outside of the symbiodinaceae. And so next I'll talk a bit about dinoflagellate feeding ecology and some work that we have planned in the Great Bay. And the origin story of this project was um, from a question that stumped me through, um, you know, a lot of graduate school and learning how to tell my science, why, are, why do dinoflagellates pump so much iron? And a reason could be is that they are mixotrophs, which means that they are able to acquire energy from both autotrophy, so um, receiving sugars from photosynthesis, but also through prey consumption, um, which can be of um, smaller planktonic species and um, particles. And dinoflagellates have this really neat appendage called a peduncle, which enables them to do this. And it's like a sword straw. So first it acts as a sword and it stabs its prey and then it slurps it up. And then, so this is great. Um, the dinoflagellates have this alternative route to acquire energy and adapt to a new environment or a changing environment, but it does come at a cost and a trade-off and that it is a, it's energetically costly um, to you know, shift to mixotrophy because um, mixotrophy requires phagocytosis and digestion. And um, when I hear those words, all I think is um, you know, metalloenzyme requirements, iron sulfur clusters of these organelles. And that's, um, uh, or that's a substantial um, amount of, energy to sustain and it requires a um, potentially a lot of metals. So that led me to, or now my talk kind of turns into a murder mystery. So I think of um, this like avenue of my research as metallomixotrophy, so trace metal influences on mixotrophy and um, learning about what are the biotic and abiotic motivators of dinoflagellate mix mixotrophy? Is it predator prey dynamics or abundance and diversity? Is it biomass differences or is it the elemental stoichiometry of predator and prey? And what are the environmental factors? Is it light? Is it temperature or biogeochemistry or all of the above? And then wondering, okay, so Dinoflagellates are theoretically able to um, acquire metals through mixotrophies. Um, what trace metals do dinoflagellates ingest through mixotrophy? Um, it could be a consumption of one metal like zinc or like iron from a homogenous prey source, or they could get many metals from a homogenous prey source, or um, they could consume many metals from a um, mixed prey source. Um, it, it's a pretty um, open field. And so I'm interested in applying this framework to study um, algal blooms and species succession, which is where the Great Bay of New Hampshire comes into play. And then also in symbiosis, um, well, back to the symbiodinaceae, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. But now I'll introduce the um, brand new um, UNH Phytoplankton Lab Great Bay uh, time series. Um, as Jen mentioned earlier, I'm a postdoc with Liz Harvey, who's the um, PI of the UNH Phytoplankton Lab. And Liz and I are both uh, phytoplankton enthusiasts. And when Liz started at the University of New Hampshire in 2019, um, she began tracking uh, phytoplankton diversity and abundance in several areas within the Great Bay of New Hampshire and also in uh, the coastal region. And so for some context, uh, the Great Bay is, um, or well, right across um, the ocean and pretty much we're, on, we're parallel with it. But it's, so it's kind of smushed in between campus and the main border on the seacoast. And it's fed by seven different tributaries and it can be the site of um, different algal blooms throughout the year. And there's also some ongoing oyster restoration. And um, the birth of the Great Bay Phytoplankton Time Series was actually the 
um, work of Molly Erickson's um, master's thesis, where um, she sampled both uh, an estuary and a coastal site, um, the estuary being at the Jackson Lab um, and the coastal site um, being in Hampton. But um, since she's graduated, we've switched to UNH's Coastal Marine Lab just because it's a little closer to campus. And she conducted weekly sampling from fall 2020 um, all the way through um, early 2022, evaluating um, where she measured um, plankton composition. So um, how many are picoeukaryotes versus nanoeukaryotes um, and so on, primary productivity, um, algal diversity and abundance with, uh, um, and she focused a lot on diatom species rich, richness and then also tracked other important metrics such as water quality. So the nutrient concentration, salinity, temperature, and tidal height. So this was a really massive effort by Molly. And what she found is that there were seasonal blooms at both sites, but there was no synchrony between the sites. So if there was an algal bloom in the estuary, it, there wasn't necessarily one on the coast or vice versa. Um, so bloom timing and the um, bloom um, community composition, so the algae that were blooming um, varied by the different sites. And there was higher diatom species richness, richness on the coast, um, but double the diatom abundance in the estuary, um, which makes sense if you um, think about um, tidal influences and evaporation, and especially in the summer. And so when I came in, um, I of course was curious about the dinoflagellates and as some of them are uh, toxin producing and form harmful algal blooms. Um, so when are they responsible for the algal blooms observed in the Great Bay? And what are the environmental drivers of these or also what are the um, biotic drivers? And so from a biotic standpoint, we're interested in, in tracking the pico and nano eukaryotes, so their food sources, um, and then the other abiotic sources or the abiotic drivers um, that could be correlated with it. And we hope to add in um, looking at um, further into the elemental um, chemistry and stoichiometry and getting into more of the trace metals. So we can answer the question, why do dinoflot or what metals do dinoflagellates ingest during prey consumption? Um, do, do, uh, does metal consumption differences promote coexistence of closely related species? Um, these two species are serratium um, frequent, which are um, frequent uh, or like some of the dominant um, phytoplankton in the Gulf of Maine. And they're closely related, but coexist. So is this because uh, they feed on different prey? Is it because they rely on different metals from feeding? And then also, does this reflect the ecological specialty? Um, so this is a different genera, Protocentrum, which recently wreaked havoc in Hampton, and I believe caused some beach closures. And um, a uh, neat aspect about this genus is that there are different ecological specialties that coexist. So there's a planktonic species and a benthic species. And so are they eating different things? Um, do they need different metals from feeding? And so on and so forth. And then also thinking about what mediates um, dinoflagellate ingestion of trace metals. So is this influenced by biomass? Is there selective feeding on larger prey? or is there selective feeding on metal rich prey as opposed to metal poor prey? And for this last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about um, when microalgae um, have foes and the, in this instance, the foes are the bacteria and um, some ongoing coccolithophore uh, bacteria symbiosis. And the Harvey lab works with um, Emiliana Huxleyi, which is a calcifying coccolithophore. So it forms a calcium carbonate skeleton, which um, called coccoliths right here, these circular plates. Um, it's globally distributed and it can also um, form algal blooms, which can be seen from space. And it commonly associates with a cosmopolitan bacteria, Pseudorolotrimonis. And this is a mutualism until the bacteria induce or release a chemical that can induce cell death. 
And that chemical is called HHQ, where the bacteria um, produce the HHQ. And what happens is um, cell stasis and mortality are triggered in the coccolithophore. So then the bacteria produces this chemical, um, stops cell growth, and sometimes causes cell death in the coccolithophore. And now all of like it can pillage all of those organelles and it's an energy. Now the coccolithophore is an energetic resource for the bacteria. And so I'm interested in how metal limitation um, incentivizes um, the bacteria to produce, H produce HHQ because when you take a closer look at the organelles that it's pillaging, um, they're chock full of iron sulfur clusters and other metal contents, which could incentivize that production. And so um, as we speak, I have some um, culture experiments going on, uh, exposing the coccolithophores to different um, metal deficiencies and with um, some collaborators from UW and Georgia Tech, we'll be looking at their uh, protein expressions and their uh, metabolomics. But right now, what these experiments look like is a lot of different cultures in an incubator. So these are sterile tissue flasks with uh, seawater and nutrient mixes. Um, they're clear because the algae were just added and haven't proliferated yet, but um, these are ongoing right now. So hopefully next time I'll have more to tell you about. But um, in the meantime, we're also um, investigating who else is on the Pseudoaltimonis hit list. So on this figure uh, on the x-axis is the HHQ concentration. HHQ is the bacterially produced chemical that induces cell lysis. On the y-axis is um, growth rate. And uh, this gray bar represents the zero line. So as HHQ in, uh, concentrations increase, coccolithophore growth is suppressed. Whereas um, diatom growth was unaffected and so was the growth of um, a different dinoflagellate. But I'm interested in um, other dinoflagellates such as temperate ones in um, the Great Bay, which, um, for, uh, which can cause harmful algal blooms, but also on the symbiodinaceae and those that form um, mutualisms with corals. And so, our undergraduate Marley is um, working on her senior thesis to ground truth um, whether symbiodinaceae cultures are susceptible to the HHQ exposure. So um, because Pseudoalteromonas is a cosmopolitan bacteria, we can work on it with microalgae other than coccolithophores such as um, coral algal symbiosis. It's um, a frequent member of the coral holobiont. And so Marley's thesis is asking the question, are these lab cultures of symbiodinaceae sensitive to the like chemical exposure of HHQ? And what this looks like is she rears cultures and then exposes them to a control and then varying and increasing concentrations of the HHQ. And we hypothesize that as HHQ concentrations increase, um, the cell proliferation will decrease and um, by working with lab cultures, we're able to, again, look at many different ecological specialties and see how their resistance varies. And so there are um, a lot of ecological implications of algal bacterial interactions. Um, so when they're friends and HHQ isn't being produced, um, the coccolithophore is able to continue growing. And sometimes this, sometimes this can result in um, blooms, which can be harmful on an ecological scale. Um, in a different light, um, when the coral and the dinoflagellate symbiont and the pseudoaltimonis are coexisting and HHQ isn't involved, um, here we have a healthy reef. However, this can quickly turn into a story of foes when this um, chemical is produced, um, but this could potentially result in um, out harmful algal blooms not happening um, when we think about the coccolithophore um, ecology. But it's also possible that um, in the coral symbiosis, the bacterial production of the HHQ could exacerbate a bleaching event. But um, first of all, ground truth whether the symbiodinaceae are um, vulnerable to this chemical. So thanks for bearing with me on um, this uh, 
evening. And so hopefully I've convinced you that um, trace metals are um, influential on how microalgal symbioses um, can act as friends, such as mutualisms, um, and also as food and in terms of influencing the feeding ecology of dinoflagellates, and this can be found in the Great Bay, and then also as foes in um, dictating whether um, coccolithophore bacterial or algal bacterial interact interactions um, take a sour turn. And so with that, I'll or so all of that to say, um, I use lab cultures and field studies to study algae as friends, food, and foes, and ask questions about trace metal influences on their symbioses and the consequences to algal physiology and their ecological impacts. And I'll start by thanking um, some of the students that I've co-supervised, including um, my, during my time at Penn State, um, URI, and also currently. And I also thank um, Scholz for having me here and um, the various institutions I've been a part of, in particular UNH and um, our funding sources. And with that, I will take any questions. Sure. Yeah, so I think so. And the reason, or one of the reasons I think so is that when you look at the different tissue fractions, the iron and also pretty much all of the metal concentrations are always higher in the algae, suggesting that it isn't just osmosis um, from the environment to the host and symbiont fractions, but there's some form of active uptake and transport from the host to the symbiont. And then also, um, you know, within a coral species and in a site, you'll see, um, you know, differences among, you know, uh, species in terms of like the metal contents. So they have, even within a species, there can be their own nutritional um, niches, and then it's um, more substantial in between species. So like closely related species living near each other have very different metal requirements. So there's some form of active uptake. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be an instance where there's too much of a good thing and sometimes it could become toxic, certainly. But I live near the Cochico River and I sometimes look at it and you can see to the bottom and it's mostly rocks and I don't think there are phytoplankton blooms happening there, or at least not yet. Um, so I think that might be an instance where there's been so much human impact that um, it's not a positive impact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So are you getting to like um, the presence of CDOM and other particulate matter? Yeah, yeah. So I think that is a big part of the story um, and um, why like that um, photosymbiosis is still able to be successful under harsh conditions. Like there, some of the particulate matter like is CDOM, which um, helps alleviate that stress. And I think um, even though there are differences in between the species and the different host symbiont pairings from this warm water site, the like 
order of magnitude difference um, between like, you know, even given all of that variation, but the difference between the offshore site is still like substantial enough that I think there is um, some sort of environmental signal, which the CDOM might be a part of, or it could, it's also um, the rock islands have slower water flow. So there's, you know, more particulate matter around. It could be um, nectin um, composition. And also like, sometimes I think about like trace metal um, additions from feces. And so, yeah, it was, that project was initially a, uh, I know side project turned dissertation chapter. So it, yeah, it answered a lot of questions or well, it answered some questions, but like left a lot more. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I believe they're also free living in the water column. We also have them like growing separately or so without algae back in the lab. And I'm not quite sure about like what, like the environmental um, factors that dictate their success or lack thereof are, but um, yeah, no, good question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Leave it there. I'll just jump over here. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here online and in person. Um, next week, at the same time, we're going to have a, a former Shoal staff member return, uh, Peg. Uh, Brady, who is the acting chief of the Office of Science and Technology in the Marine Ecosystem Division of NOAA. So that talk will be happening next Tuesday. Thank you, Hannah, for a great talk. See you, everybody online.